give you a little bit about of background which is provided within the document look at an actual case which um, I've just used as a basis of illustration and then we'll talk a little bit more about application looking at the urine lamb some information re, uh, related to the urine lamb the rationale for the current uh, guidance that's been provided how we implement that algorithm uh, and then results uh, testing and the interpretation so when you look at these numbers that are displayed here let me just get my pointer when you look at these numbers that are, dis are displayed here, looking at the estimated uh, TB incidence and mortality within South Africa, we know that TB is still the leading cause of death within South Africa, especially when coupled with HIV. And we know that South Africa accounts for 3% of the global TB population. So we do have serious challenges when it comes to TB uh, incidents and management, even looking at the current uh, cure rates that we have. You can see from this data where the incidence is, is here rated in the blue bars and the estimated, I'm just going to minimize this, the estimated number of deaths is in this line graph here do documented in red. You can see that with time, we have seen a decrease in, t in both TB incidents and TB death, right? But it's way, way too slow. In comparison to looking to where we need to be in 2035, now when we're looking at the uh, TB targets, we we're looking at a 95% reduction in TB deaths, and we're looking at cutting new cases by 90%. So in the backdrop of this really high TB burden, we've, we've made some progress with regards to diagnosis. Uh, we've got the gene expert, which was introduced in South Africa. I think it was 2012, 2013, and when the in the last gene expert, 96 percent. I mean, I recall when we were using smears in the old days to diagnose uh, TB. We know that culture is the gold standard uh, when it comes to the diagnosis of of TB. But when we look at the turnaround times of these results in terms of being able to diagnose TB, you can see that the Gene Expert Ultra, even though it technically could be evaluated as well as the Gene Expert Ultra, uh, the turnaround time for these tests, the GXP uh, was about 95 to 120 minutes and the Ultra sitting at just over 60 minutes, we're still seeing that the turnaround time for these tests is a bit long. And when we look at challenges, and I think for, for all of us clinicians that are there on the ground, there are specific challenges of diagnosing TB and HIV positive clients, especially to be able to start same day treatment as possible when we have turnaround times that are looking at a day. I know on average when I was, you know, before COVID hit and we were sitting in facilities, I mean, clients were told to come back after two or three days to get their results. It wasn't a, a same day test that you could have a result back to be able to action as a clinician. The other challenge that we have is that we know that as immunosuppression progresses within our HIV positive clients, that TB does become more difficult to diagnose. And certainly we know that in these clients, we can see a more disseminated picture. We can definitely, we see a rise in extra pulmonary disease, as well as manifestation of TB within those clients. And we also see possibility pulmonary TB. And so what we find is some of these clients may also not be able to expirate sputum. And where the bulk of our tests for TB rely on sputum, this is a challenge. And if you think about this problem in children as well, where children categorically, it's really difficult to get uh, sputum, especially in the very young ones that are presenting with TB. This is uh, certainly a challenge amongst our younger population as well. What we do know though, is that when we fail to diagnose TB early, there is increased mortality in HIV TB co-infected patients.
because we know that there's a rapid disease progression, especially in these clients, because they are severely immunocompromised. As a result of the delay in diagnosis, there's also a delay in treatment initiation. And then the other complications which do happen when we do get to initiate them onto, onto therapy. So this is a case which I, I had seen when I was watching a, a, a CME that was conducted last year. And I'm going to just use this case as an illustrative purpose and we'll come back to it again later. And I'll just share this case as it was shared at the CME. There was a 53 year old male who presented in a local health facility in April 2020. He had fatigue, fever, cough, and generalized body pains. The CME had not um, uh, elaborated as to what the duration of this cough was, etc. They noted that he had been in contact with tourists from Europe and that when he presented, he did not complain of any shortness of breath. He did not have a sore, a sore throat, a blocked nose, and that also asked about the famous loss of taste and loss of smell. And he does not have any known medical uh, illnesses and had not known to be sick in the past six to eight years. On examination, he looked ill, he was miserable, he was not jaundiced, was not dehydrated. They noticed a mild pallor, some bilateral cervical lymph adenopathy, normal blood pressure, slight tachycardia, slightly raised uh, uh, temperature, respiratory rate was slightly raised, SATs at room A were 98%, normal GM, and he was, they had a ward HP that was 6.5. Nothing remarkable on the CNS or the CVS or abdominal. They didn't mention whether they'd found any hepatosplenomegaly, but he did have bibasal crepitations on examination. What they had looked at and had, had uh, placed as the differential at the time, because this is the era of COVID, was COVID-19, a bronchopneumonia, the possibility that this would be RVD related, a community acquired pneumonia and PTB would always be in the midst whenever we are considering any, um, any uh, respiratory opportunistic infections. He tested HIV positive. His, uh, he had the swabs done for SARS COVID 2 and he had an expert done. His x ray they noted and they hadn't provided the x ray at features of a patty reticular opacities in the perihyla lung. They decided to treat him as an atypical pneumonia, as an outpatient. He did not have any danger signs on his examination. They deferred ART until they had their TB diagnostics back, and they were also concerned about COVID-19 and completed the rest of the baseline bloods, uh, including an RPR, and because he was 53, they did a PSA, and they only did an HP uh, in view of the fact that his, uh, his ward HP was 7.5. They provided him with Coamoxiclav 675 uh, three times daily. They provided him with the azithromycin and panado. And their follow-up plan was to check those results, assess his response to the antibiotics, uh, and those results came back as negative for SARS-CoV-2 and the gene expert showed that uh, mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis was not detected. He had a CD4 of 25, his CAT was negative, renal function was normal, negative hep B, and HP of 8.1. They hadn't provided any MCV or MCH and a PSA. So when, and, and I just wanted to show you that case and we'll come back to it in a little while. So when we're talking about the urine lamb, and I can never ever pronounce this lipo uh, rabinomanin, right? And I'm just going to call it lamb from now on. This is a, a glycolipid that's a component of the outer cell wall of mycobacteria. And it's found to be released by metabolically active or degenerating MTB cells. And when this is cleared by the urine, it's detectable in the urine. So we find that, that this lamb glycolipid is predominantly in TB, people who have active TB disease. So when we find this lamb, it's indicative of active TB. 
what we know from before is that in HIV positive patients, previously there's a select group of patients who we this test was restricted for, and I'll talk a little bit about that more. But we know that we see that there's increased sensitivity as immunosuppression increases. And, and there are several things which, which they've thought this could be due to a high bacillary load or an antigen load. They thought that it may be that in these clients, there's an increased glomerular permeability, which then gives you high antigen levels in the urine, or the fact that there is a genital urinary uh, TB disease. What we also know, though, that in these clients that are have advanced HIV, that disseminated or extra pulmonary TB is also common in this group. And so when we look at the lamb, whilst we've said that it's found in the cell wall of mycobacteria, we it's noted that it does not distinguish between the different species of mycobacteria. So we do need to have uh, MTB specific tests that are attached to it, such as your MTB uh, 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 ultra culture uh, or LPA or culture and uh, um, and DST. However, in the you know the WHO has has placed the guidance, and you've looked at our values in terms of uh, TB within South Africa. That in endemic areas for TB, the lamb antigen that's detected in a clinical sample is therefore likely going to be attributed to tuberculosis. Am I still audible, Chris? I'm sorry, I hear something. You are very much audible. Does the request colleagues please mute your microphones, please? Thank you. Please go ahead, Trishal. Okay. So, um, so when we look at the guidance document that was released in April of this year, there's several rationales that have been placed around why they've changed it. So the previous guidance in the OPD setting was that it can be administered in, in inpatient setting, sorry, is that it can be administered in really seriously ill patients with advanced HIV in a hospital setting. Right, and, and this is irrespective of whether uh, TB is suspected or not, and irrespective of whether we have that patient's CD4 count or not. So, the, and the WHO has further, you know, uh, uh, stipulated that, that this guidance holds true when they look at the data for inpatient settings. So, when we look at our inpatient settings for for the use of urine lamb, it adopts the recommendation that when we want to find active TB in HIV positive patients, whether TB is suspected or not, by virtue of the fact that you are hospitalized, this implies that you have, are a seriously ill patient and that it should be completed irrespective of what that patient's CD4 is or whether they have advanced HIV disease. Previously, in the outpatient setting, uh, it was really uh, restricted to clients who had a CD4 that was less than 100, who also was a presumed TB uh, suspect. And what's, what's come about uh, with the WHO guidance is they haven't changed that, but our guidance has, has adopted the recommendations to assist urine lamb based on some data that's come out of uh, some newer studies that even in clients where the CD4 is 200 or less, that that lamb should be used to assist for diagnosis in those clients with uh, advanced HIV disease and presumptive TB. So when we look at the first rationale, so the rationale is that what I've said to you before, there is greater sensitivity and improvement in advanced HIV disease. And so Shah et al. did a systematic review in 2016 where they looked at, uh, they included 12 studies, and in there they had specifically selected out six studies which looked at the accuracy of uh, LAM uh, in clients who were HIV positive with symptomatic disease. And there they found a pool sensitivity to be 
percent, which is relatively lowish with the highest specificity uh, of 92 percent. What they found is that in a subgroup of HIV positive patients, with a CD4 less than 200, the pool sensitivity was about 56%. In 2019, they, when more studies were completed to look at uh, urine LAM in the context of diagnostics for patients, they had looked at an additional eight, eight, uh, eight uh, studies. Uh, it was 16 studies in total, of which eight of those looked at um, uh, HIV positive clients with TB symptoms, and they found a very similar finding to the previous to the previous setting that the pool sensitivity was sitting at 42% with a specificity of 91%, and that the sensitivity amongst clients with the CD4 that had less than 200 was 54%. There were slight differences between outpatients and inpatients, but because of this and uh, this uh, this data. This was one of the reasons around that change of util utility of urine lamp in the OPD setting. This was a study um, that, that I also had a look at, which looked at urine lamp in HIV positive ambulatory patients who had CD4 less than 200, which was in plus medicine. So it was a prospective observational study in Malawi and Mozambique. Um, where there were 456 patients, they conducted a clinical exam. TB diagnostics that were completed was a urine lamb, microscopy, expert MTB RIF, sputum and culture at the first consult. And then those clients were then followed up for six months. And what they found was 45% of those 456 actually had TB by the gold standard. The lamb was positive in 82.4%, microscopy in 33.7%, an expert was positive in 40%. So one of the things that we can see where LAM is particularly of utility is in clients with advanced disease. So I just want to understand if you, you know, because when your client comes to you, um, they won't have a CD4 count at their first presentation, or they may have a CD4 count if they've previously been there within your facility and you need to go and trace it. What is the HIV? Sorry, Chris, am I still with you? Uh, you are from my side, you are breaking up a little bit. I don't know if the rest of the colleagues are experiencing the same. Uh, let me just look for my APN quickly. I am currently. Uh, let me just ensure I'm just going to go out and Is that a bit better, Chris? Mm, that is better. Um, uh, we, we, we got some advice from Bensol to start your slide again because you broke up. OK. Great. So you've launched the poll. I will. Um, so amongst these clients that are below, a 10 year old with persistent oral candidiasis, a two year old with herpes zoster, a two year old with a 27 year old with bacterial pneumonia. Do you think it's one of those, all of those or none of those? How would you define advanced HIV disease based on clinical grounds? And I'll just ask you, uh, Wenzel, just to assist, uh, I mean, Chris, with um, with uh, 
providing the results. Yeah, so the results are coming through. We'll just give um, this seven responses thus far. We'll just give all the colleagues opportunity. Maybe some are still thinking it through. So we had seven responses. Sure. Um, I'll give the final tally as soon as all of them come through. Thus far, still seven responses. Um, colleagues, basically, for those of you that might be uncertain what to do, you'll see it's just a basic multiple choice. Um, don't worry, you're not going to be penalized in any way. This is completely anonymous. So take a yes. guess if you're not. <laughs> it's completely anonymous. We don't know who's answered these questions. So we've got 10 responses thus far. Uh, how, how many colleagues do we have on the call? It's it's just a bit more than 28. OK, so we've got just over. Over what's that 50%? Is that correct? So we are at 11 at the moment. Uh, colleagues, let's let's give each other another 10 seconds and then I'll announce the poll results. Those of you that still haven't done the poll, please uh, quickly just select any of the five. You may just be correct. You've got a 20% odds to be correct or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rochelle, it's uh, the opportunity to give you the results. 7%. Uh, let, let me do it like this. So, uh, as as the leaderboard, I'll start from from the lowest uh, from from the lowest ranking up to the highest. So, seven okay. percent. Uh, no, none of the colleagues decided that it would either be a two-year-old with herpes zoster or none of the above. Seven percent of the respondents uh, decided that it should be a ten-year-old with persistent oral candida. Um, then, uh, in terms of um, the second highest tally, was that 21% of the participants believe that it's a 27-year-old with a bacterial pneumonia, and then a roaring 71% of all the participants believe that it's all of the above. Wonderful. So, so I'm assuming that that, and I'm assuming that uh, these colleagues have have completed your ACC course <laughs> because you guys got the answer. Those seventy odd percent of you got the answer correct. So, when we look at the WHO definition of advanced HIV, right? Those of you who said A, which was ten percent. Uh, which was the 10-year-old with persistent oropharyngeal uh, uh, candidiasis, you're also correct. So when we look at how do we determine uh, our, pa our patients that have advanced HIV disease? So in those who are older than five years of age, it's a CD4 less than 200 or WHO stage 3 or 4. All children under five years of age with HIV are considered to have advanced HIV disease. So hence that two-year-old with herpes zoster that's diagnosed as HIV positive is having advanced HIV. Uh, we do not just we do not uh, look at stable suppressed children under five years of age on art as having uh, advanced HIV, and then your seriously ill uh, HIV positive clients. So those who are coming in that those are your emergency clients, whether it's an adult, an adolescent or a child. So you're looking for your danger signs amongst your adults when they come through and your danger signs, particularly amongst your children when they come through. The last uh, three points here are not part of the WHO definition, but it's something which we thought was really important because we are noticing that a large proportion of our clients that are actually coming to facilities with advanced HIV presentations are clients who disengage from care. And so those clients who are disengaging and returning, uh, your, 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 those that are above the age of five with WHO stage three or four clients failing ART or those with other comorbidities 
we felt that these clients also should be considered as advanced HIV. However, for the purposes of this guidance document, they would only look at the four which I have uh, placed here on top. And so this understanding that when our clients come to us and whenever we read guidelines and we see a CD4 less than 200 or a WHO stage three and four, it's important to really know when we are seeing the client within our clinical consultation, who is the client that I need to be looking at to see what the utility is for our them. And I'm not going to go through each of these and these slides will be presented to you. Um, and so you saw that our client that has a pneumonia, that 27 year old that has a pneumonia, that one that that 10 year old that had persistent oral candidiasis, we regarded as a WHO stage three as a definition for advanced HIV and then WHO stage four uh, uh, conditions are listed here. Because I think that oftentimes whenever we see um, we see guidelines, it also put it back into the context of you and your client within the context of your consulting room. So the second rationale was that this the utility of the lamb is also of value within children because there's evidence of reducing morbidity and mort mortality in children with advanced HIV disease. And I provided you with the definition. So in within that same Cochrane review, they had looked at three different studies. Um, one was in Tanzania in the OPD setting, children six to 14 weeks. There was another study, I think, within uh, South Africa, which was in an OPD and an inpatient setting in children under 15 years of age. And the third was in hospitalized children uh, under 12 years of age. Looking at uh, the, the use of LAM in being able to diagnose uh, TB within this patient cohort. And found, what they found was a pool sensitivity of 47% and a slightly lower specificity than the adult population, which you saw from that review was 91% uh, uh, within amongst the, the pediatric cohorts. They, the, the thinking is that the lower specificity may be due to uh, cross-reactivity with the antigen, with bacteria, either from the perineal skin or the stool because of contamination during urine sample collections, because our kidneys would usually be, uh, be having urine bags for the collection, and those may be on the skin for several hours until the child actually produces urine. And certainly, the recommendation whenever we are going to be using the lamb is that we need to ensure that we use sterile containers, single use containers, uh, when we are going to be uh, doing testing for lamb. And the third uh, looks at evidence for reducing mortality in uh, people living with HIV. So this study uh, was completed um, in, it was a multi-country trial in 10 hospitals in Africa four in South Africa, two in Tanzania, uh, two in Zimbabwe. Um, and they took 18 year olds with at least a one TB symptom, which was either fever, cough, night sweats, or self-reported weight loss. So your WHO symptom screening tool who required hospitalization. Uh, they had excluded and an, a large proportion of these trials because we they were looking at lamb uh, in the in the in the context of diagnosis, a large proportion had excluded any who had been exposed to anti-TB treatment before enrollment. And so 2,679 uh, uh, patients were included in the trial and they were randomized one is to one to either have urine lamb uh, within the workup or no urine lamb. And you can see uh, with the no urine lamb in the blue bar, uh, the blue line here, and the 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 urine lamb being the one which would be pink or purple, depending on what you see that as, they found that the mortality in the the lamb arm was 18% versus 21% within the the no urine lamb arm. There was another trial which uh, was done, which was a two arm RCT in Edendale and Malawi 
where the standard of care was used, which was MTB roof at the time, or they had MTB roof and the urine lamb. There were 2,600 patients that were involved in the study where they looked at the primary outcome was all cause mortality at 56 days. This STAM trial, however, did not find a significant difference in the all cause mortality between the arms. But when they look at the, the benefit for of mortality, for that there might be benefit for mortality uh, within predefined high risk groups, specifically low CD4 counts, we know that uh, anemia, especially HP less than eight, are um, uh, associated with an increased risk of mortality in those with clinically suspected TB. And then there's another study that looked at when is the best time to do these samples. And so this was a prospective study which was in four hospitals in 80 in Cape Town in uh, those who are HIV infected above 18 years of age, they had 123 HIV infected patients. And they provided matched random samples and early morning urine samples. Of the 123, 41%, 33% had a definitive diagnosis of TB, and 67% uh, were noted as having probable TB. And when we look at the sensitivity of LAM in the detection of, of TB within the random versus the the early morning urine, you can see that in the random where there, where there was those with definitive TB, it increased from 12% to 39%, and in those with probable TB from 10% to 24%. So certainly, uh, you know, if your client presents later in the day, we're not saying they shouldn't use it, but we do know that there does seem to be increased sensitivity related to the lamb in early morning uh, specimens. So when we come back to our case now, that 53-year-old who had symptoms, a positive, presumptive TB, uh, who was HIV positive, and a lower respiratory tract infection. Do you think he qualified Any of the colleagues want to respond? Thanks, Michelle. So this and is why? anyone that would like to to, to maybe uh, uh, step out of your comfort zone and maybe give some comments. Um, you are more than welcome to raise your hand, and uh, then the floor is yours. Then you can interact with Michelle. So far, there's silence, Rochelle. Um, please, please go ahead yet again. Well, they, uh, you can, could... they can put it in the chat. They can, they can put it in the chat, uh, and I'll just continue. Thank you. I'll monitor the chat from my side, and uh, as soon as there's anything posted there, I will definitely let you know. Please do proceed, Rochelle. Sure. So when we look at the, the, the diagnostic algorithm that's within the lamb, so our client was in an outpatient setting, all right? He was ambulatory and he had symptoms and signs of TB. So if the count is less than 200 and the results are not older than six months, you can perform a urine lamb. Remember, the other context is patients with advanced HIV. And our definition is, WHO clinical stage three or four. Based on the fact that that client had a lower respiratory tract infection, and when we got CD4 back, you saw it was 25. At that presentation, the urine lamb may have allowed them to possibly get a diagnosis sooner rather than later. So what does the diagnostic algorithm say? That we perform the urine lab. If there's no CD4 available, this should be requested, which was in the case. And those who have advanced disease or are seriously ill should have the urine lab, which was in that case. What I have, um, uh, I have a little bit of a differing of opinion and colleagues out there can speak. So the other guidance in the outpatient setting is that if the CD4 is more than 200, the patient is not eligible for LAM, we agree. If they don't have advanced HIV, they are also not able. So if they're not WHO stage three or four, they, they say refer for TPT, ART or Bactrim. I would put a provisor there. 
I don't mind the bathroom. I would be in any client with presumptive TB symptoms before we start them on heart, except for one patient population, we would want to first do diagnostics on them. And Rochelle, so that the pregnant patient population, yes. My, my, my sincere apologies. Um, I, I think you might have a bandwidth challenge on your side. Can I maybe please just ask you and, and apologies, colleagues, for just indulge us if you could maybe firstly just um, unshare your, your screen because that definitely does take bandwidth, the fact that we are seeing you. And then secondly, would it be possible for you just to restart your slide set again um, as what we are seeing at the current moment, the slides are frozen you on this side. You want me to, you want me to uh, put my camera off? Yes, yeah, switch your camera off firstly because that will save bandwidth. And then secondly, if you could just unshare your screen and reshare again. Apologies, colleagues, for, for, for this glitch. These things always do happen when it comes to virtual type of uh, engagements. Um, Rochelle, I'll apologize. tell you. I'll, I'll tell you from my side when we see your screen again. Thank you. And apologies for interrupting you. No, no problem. Uh, I'm, I'm just glad that that you 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 uh, let me know that we weren't able to see. So, can you see my screen? Yes, you Chris, can. And can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you um, very perfectly. And then you can just put it in presentation mode, so we'll be able to see your screen properly. Thanks. Please do proceed. Thanks. Perfect. Thank so, you, Rochelle. So, so sorry, Chris. Can you tell me where where did you where where was I last heard? Um, we we have heard you, but your screen got frozen. So so the hearing was not the problem was the screen that got frozen um, both both on your on your video as well as the the slides that you were projecting. OK, all right. So I'm just going to just go through what I spoke about earlier, just with regards to the utility of LAM in, in, in our different settings. So that client of ours that was WHO stage three uh, on presentation, ideally should have also had a urine LAM completed as a point of care test to assist in the diagnosis because he, he, he met the definition for advanced HIV disease. In the admitted setting, all hospitalization, hospitalized patients are considered seriously ill, and all of them should have a urine lamb done, irrespective of whether we think they have TB or not, and irrespective of what their CD4 count is. So once we have decided within our outpatient setting or within our inpatient setting that the urine lamb has been done, we collect the urine lamb, and in addition to that, uh, we have to send out other samples. So depending on that patient-specific presentation or patient-specific population, for example, if we had a client who presented um, with a, a pleural effusion or you had a client that you were also concerned about where you had other samples that you could send off, whether you were concerned about a client that had a meningitis, etc., the gene expert ultra test should also be sent off concurrently. In addition to that, you know, we would start all of these clients on broad spectrum antibiotics, but in because we are concerned about our issues with drug resistant TB, uh, we should not be using any fluoroquinolones for the for the management of bacterial infections. And I work and I manage clients uh, uh, primarily within the public sector, and that really is um, really is followed well. So when we come back to our client, that COVID two came back negative. We don't have the luxury of doing induced sputums now within the context of COVID, but certainly, you know, there has been value in several studies that have shown that uh, induced sputum does increase the yield when it comes to TB diagnosis, and the, PEC, the client's gene expert was negative. I revealed to you their baseline results and the regimen that they were started on when they returned to care. They were also given cotramoxazole prophylaxis. They were also given INH and pyridoxine. What are your thoughts on this patient's management? 
So colleagues, you're welcome to either interject if any of you would like to raise your hands and just take either a guess uh, uh, or, or maybe contribute any comments uh, that you would like to raise. Alternatively, drop something in the chat box. Uh, we are eagerly awaiting your response. I do know some of my colleagues, Arwen, before I start, stopped, uh, uh, started sharing my screen, I had seen a few of my colleagues from HST and TV HIVK were on the call. Can I call on, 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 on you, Cynthia and Mandisa, just to hear what your thoughts are? Cynthia has just raised her hand. Cynthia, the floor is <laughs> You're more than welcome to please proceed. Thanks, colleague. Please go ahead. OK, uh, thanks, Rochelle. Uh, from this case, um, before I could initiate an on the regimen um, of TLD and IPT, I want to first check the presenting signs and symptoms, whether the patient, the, this client is responding or not, because if he still persists to have the signs, I would uh, re, uh, defer to initiate and do further investigation to exclude the TP, especially after knowing the the, um, the CD4 count uh, of, uh, of 25. You said the lamb was also done. Sorry, I missed that. No, other the lamb was not done in this patient. Surely he's a candidate uh, candidate for the lamb. Yes, yes, yes. So he would have been a candidate for the urine lamb. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So, are there any other colleagues who had any other thoughts uh, uh, around this patient? And yes, Cynthia, you know, I would agree with you because I think that whenever we look at a guidance document, the guidance document always falls within the ambit of our broader diagnostic algorithm. And you'll see this in particular when it comes to outcomes related to what we find on the lamb and what we find on the expert. And so when we look at the susceptible TB diagnostic algorithm, in a client with advanced HIV, with a presumptive TB diagnosis, where our gene expert is negative, our diagnostics do not stop there, as you had said. And so in our HIV positive clients, we would want to collect that sample for either culture and LPA or culture and DST. Because if we have a client with advanced HIV, we certainly want to make sure, especially in this client or in any other client, that we have excluded the leading cause of mortality in our HIV and TB patient population. When it comes to our pre, and that's the non-pregnant patient population, we know that in the pregnant patient population, they would get an expert whether they had symptoms or not at baseline on their first antenatal visit, uh, whether they were newly diagnosed or they had uh, previously been on AOT and they now have a new diagnosis of, of HIV. And what we can see from the guidance, which you will also see within uh, within the, the 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 clinical guidance document for the urine lamb, is we want to review what's happening. We want to look at whether if this client is really ill, what is the issues? Can we get a TB chest X-ray? Are there other investigations that we can look at where we are concerned about? And when you look at the TPT algorithm, as you mentioned, Cynthia. If our TB screening is negative, then that client certainly in the non-pregnant uh, patient population as well may be eligible for TPT. When we have a presumptive TB, TB, um, TB symptom screen and we do our TB investigations and the, if those investigations are positive, so we get a gene expert that comes back that's uh, uh, positive rifampicin susceptible, we would start them on DSTB. If the TB investigations, if our gene expert is, is uh, or, and when we talk about TB investigations here, we go back to that gene expert algorithm, which would include a culture and LPA or a culture um, and DST. And then we have a definitive diagnosis of no TB. Because remember, we regard culture as the gold standard. We reconsider IPT only after three months and only if there's no TB symptoms. In our pregnant patient population, the, when we would give IPT is also dependent 
on what their gene expert result is and what their CD4 count is. So certainly in our clients, when we are managing them and we're looking at guidance that comes out, it's always in the context of how do we manage this patient holistically. So if the lamb is positive, Right, we would start our patient on first line TB treatment, children for four, and we want to get back our gene expert ultra result. So if the gene expert is positive, we want to ensure that we are dealing with drug susceptible TB because we know that we do have a significant uh, DRTB uh, patient population. And if it is MDRTB, then those clients need to be urgently stopped on their on their refer for and engaged into a, an MDRTB uh, site where they can get the appropriate management based on the the latest guidelines where we have the non injectable regimens that are being provided to them. I'll go to the other end. If our gene expert is positive and the lamb is negative, we would then treat based on the resistance pattern. So if it's susceptible TB, we would provide them with susceptible TB treatment. If it's resistant TB, we would provide them with uh, RIF resistant TB. So what happens if our, our gene expert is negative? So then depending on where you are and depending on the context in which your client presents, the one thing which we have said is in all negative patients, we would send off the sputum sample or a non sputum sample, depending on whether we've got suspicions. Is there pleural fluid? Is there, C, uh, is there a large lymph node? We can aspirate. Is there ascites, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can uh, be able to get a definitive diagnosis because ultimately we do want a bacteriological diagnosis. And we also want to look, especially in the context where our clients are not responding well to treatment. If our clients come and have the presentation of pneumonia, we would have started them on uh, appropriate antibiotics. If they had a bacterial chest infection, we would consider PCP if they particularly came with a very high respiratory rate and their SATs were low. And in our context today, because we have seen TB and COVID, we would also have been looking at COVID as they did in our patient. We have the option in our clients where if we have an ultrasound, and I'll talk a little bit about the other diagnostics just now, to perform a chest x-ray if you have this available. Uh, with a, and I know that this may not be available at a PHC level, but this then speaks to our, our review of patients and referral of patients between our NEMOT nurses and whether they have sessional doctors there or local referring facilities to be able to, to quickly assess uh, or your CHCs where you usually may have a chest x-ray that is available. And we have the option of starting in pretty TB treatment. What we know is that in some, if your patient is really stable, we don't really have radiological investigations. We can defer treatment, uh, although in, in, in this would generally be done in very rare circumstances, especially in our clients with advanced HIV. But whatever the case is, if we have decided that we are starting TB treatment in the context of having the gene expert negative, and we are waiting for our culture and LPA or culture and DS, uh, our DST, we certainly need to ensure patient follow up, not only for a definitive bacterial diagnosis, especially if we've decided to treat them on the basis of a chest X-ray or where we have the LF lamp positive, we've started them on TB treatment and we're certainly going to look at other samples and those results when they come back. And then we, we need to remember the patient in the middle of this, especially where this diagnosis may be happening at a higher level and then may be down referred and the necessary mechanisms in place to ensure continuity of care. So, you know, what we find, especially within our HIV positive clients is that, you know, it's usually, you know, adjunctive. It may not really be diagnostic. We may have non-cavitatory disease. We might have pulmonary infiltrates 
Often in advanced disease, it may involve the lower lobe and not typically the upper lobes. We know that if you have access to an abdominal ultrasound, especially as we said that in our clients with advanced HIV, you know that they generally can have a higher incidence of disseminated TB. And if we're looking for uh, classical uh, features that we might find, intra-abdominal lymph nodes more than a centimeter with the central hyperdense density uh, in the, within the lymph nodes, ascites has been uh, uh, commonly associated with a with strong correlation with, with uh, t uh, abdominal TB, splenic hypodensities in granuloma, and a combination of those two as well, peritoneal thickening and small bowel thickening. When we look at pleural fluid, if you do have clients that present with uh, with uh, pleural uh, effusions, you know, ADAs that you have completed in an uh, exudative uh, effusion that would come out with more than 50% of lymphocytes, you know, proportion is suggestive of TB. And your culture, you know, generally those sensitivities can be between 15 and 60%. In lymph nodes that are more than uh, two centimeters, generally you can have a high yield using a you know a larger 18 gauge needle um, with biopsy and culture going up to 96 percent. So when we're sitting with these patients, um, whether it's at a PHC or a CHC or a hospital level, at hospital level you're going to have access to so much more. At a PHC level. Um, and this is just a, a question to the colleagues. You know, I know that within KZN, the urine lamb was originally rolled out firstly in medical wards uh, within hospitals, both district and regional hospitals, and then it was moved to CHCs, and now it's meant to be accessible at PHCs as well. My question is, uh, is this available within your facilities? at all levels of care, or is it still restricted to a CHC or a hospital? That's a question to colleagues. Uh, I'm, I'm equally keen to, to, to know. Um, I, I think, Rochelle, you will, you will fondly remember that not long ago, me and you were at the facility um, that actually was stocked with, um, with the test kits. However, the staff inside the facility did not know about the existence of these test kits. We eventually were f finding out and it was actually locked away inside the pharmacy and it was about to expire without anyone ever using it. So um, maybe even in facilities where you you might be working, there there might be that you are unaware of. So so maybe from from the floor, any of the participants that would like to contribute in your area of South Africa that you work, um, how is the reach of the special investigation? Is it restricted or is it widely available? Um, we look forward to your comments. Anyone from uh, KZN? Uh, we've, I know we've got Eastern Cape and KZN. Which other provinces do we have on the call, Chris? I see some uh, a colleague or two from Gauteng as well. Um, and uh, there, there are some familiar uh, names and some unfamiliar names as well. If any of you have any of the provinces or any of the regions, we would love to hear your contribution in terms of if you could maybe give us an idea where you are based, um, how is the availability of the special investigation? Are they aware if it um, I'm, I'm checking the, the conversation chat. There's, there's no responses whatsoever. Is there anyone that would like uh, to, to raise your hand and maybe contribute and respond? I saw Lebo. Lebo's in the free states, I think. Lebo? One of my colleagues. Uh, Lebo, uh, if you are still around, please go ahead. Good day, uh, Dr. Chris. And good day, Dr. Rochelle. Um, I think I missed that point. Uh, what you wanted to know is it about the lamb in the hospitals? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I I know that there had originally been a phased approach where it was firstly um, 
uh, introduced uh, where the TB managers trained all of the hospitals and then it was moved from hospitals down to CHC. And I know that on my recent conversation, I know that within KZN, where I'm particularly residing, that it's meant to be also available at a PHC level. So I just want you to understand, you know, we have this guidance document which can provide, uh, you know, some some support for you in diagnosing TB in this really difficult patient population, but is it actually available? If it is, is it restricted? Like to hospital, CHC, PHC? Yes, as far as I know, it was for the hospitals uh, in Lijoliput, or since we're in Lej, it was only for the hospitals. But I uh, wouldn't say for sure that we have already started with it. I will need to come back to you on that one. Great. So I know that's Free State. Are there any your colleagues from Gauteng? Have they seen the lamb being available for nurse clinicians and doctors to use? Anyone from Gauteng still online that would like to respond? Uh, there's silence. Uh, maybe people are, are, are scared. Uh, it will really not dare to say I'm unsure. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Maybe you uh, can. So, so it will be a great thing to go back and see, especially if you're sitting um, at a, a, a hospital level or a PHC or a CHC, you know, to engage with your TB coordinator uh, or to engage with your, your, uh, at your, your nerve center meetings to begin to identify what is the plan for urine lamb? Is it available? Because it may be available uh, or it may not be available. Because it's wonderful give, doing all of this training, Chris, but then, you know, we need to be able to ensure that uh, the, the, the process is, needs to start with availability. If it's yes, available, it. the second step would then be training of the nursing staff because you don't need to be a doctor to do this. And we'll talk a little bit about the test shortly and so Rich, training of Rich. the doctors. Yes. Uh, Mandisa's hand is up. Let's give Mandisa an opportunity. Over to you, Mandisa. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Thanks, Amish Erosh, for your insightful uh, presentation. Um, however, um, as Eastern Cape, as you as you might have seen on the chat, uh, we are mostly supporting um, a district uh, on a, a PHC for PHC and CHC level, and uh, really LEM is something that is is on discussion. Uh, I understand that even yesterday there was a a, a call, a similar call from the Department of Health. I'm sure it's something that is being introduced uh, because we are mostly supporting CHCs and PHCs. Really, it's not something that uh, we do. Uh, however, we are going to take it further with the program managers for TB and HIV uh, so that we see if maybe uh, it's something that is being considered for our PHCs. Thank you. Thank you. So that's Thanks, Mike, that's, uh, So, Thank so you. some comments the chat function, Rochelle and colleagues, um, they, they, there's a comment in terms of the city of Tswane in Gauteng province that the test is currently only done in hospitals, but now will be rolled out to CHG. So I think that is encouraging. There's a further comment in terms of the Eastern Cape Krasani district is still in hospitals and it will be rolled out to, to CHGs and not yet to primary health care facilities. So I think there is definitely similarity in terms of the status quo between Gauteng as well as the district in the Eastern Cape. And then um, uh, there, there is another comment here that says currently training of clinicians in CHC, CHCs is ongoing in preparation for the phased in rollout in the city of Tswane. So thank you so much for Nkwaku, um, Luiso, Nkwaku yet again for those comments. Lebo, uh, you have raised your hand. Please go ahead. Yes, so we had in, in Lech, we had also in Kronstadt in Kronstadt Hospital and two hospitals also in the Odendal and the Bongani Hospital. But uh, 
we ran out of stock. So, and when they checked in, they were told that they were still busy amending the guidelines they will send once the policies are out again. I see. Thanks a lot uh, for no, that. Thank, thanks, because, you know, I think that um, uh, except for one facility that I know of within um, KZN, the gene expert ultra if we just look at that as our entry level diagnostic there is only one facility where you can actually get a result within two hours and start same day treatment and that's in a center of excellence uh called prince Cyril zulu within the etigrini municipality so the clients are presented at seven o'clock in the morning and have their gene experts taken by 11 o'clock, they have a diagnosis and have started treatment if their, their GXP is positive. So I think that especially if we're looking at reducing our incidence rates and ensuring that we have active case finding um, and being able, especially in this patient population where the lamb is going to be, be utilized, um, being able to, um, oh, sorry, what have I done? Uh, being able to um, have access to these uh, modalities is certainly something to be important. And so the other follow up on that client that we saw that was the 53 year old with the CD4 of 25, whose gene expert was negative, uh, who was hep B negative with a CLAT negative uh, and an HB of uh, uh, 7.5 on presentation. He had been started on TLD, cotramoxazole, and that also started him on iron, uh, TPT prophylaxis. And he was seen uh, after a month on TLD and seemed to be doing fine. And that also educated him for some strange reason about symptoms of TB, because not some strange reason, his CD4 was 25. And what subsequently happened was that he, he came back to the site shortly after that visit presenting with fever, headache and symptoms of meningitis and had to be up preferred. Where at that time, his gene expert then revealed GXP or mycobacterium tuberculosis was detected and he had rifampicin sensitive TB. He did not have uh, any, um, any uh, cryptococcal meningitis and he was had his INH stopped and was subsequently moved on to TB treatment um, uh, with INH and started on steroids. And I think that when we look at the risk of iris in our clients with, um, with uh, advanced HIV, certainly one of the things which they thought of when they looked at their case was that client had disseminated TB at presentation but our diagnostics were not completely uh, utilized in order to diagnose it. So another question for you, when we talk about urine lamb testing, if you can launch the poll, can be completed in up to eight hours on a fresh sample kept at room temperature. The results can be interpreted in direct sunlight. The results must be read between 25 and 40 minutes. It can be, sorry, that should be completed, not complicated, on samples refrigerated between two to eight degrees following, immediately following removal or none of the above. So. Thank you. So please ponder on that and uh, you can uh, you can choose the one, even our so colleagues when, from college. When you, get, so try. when you get access to the lamb, how, which samples can you use it on? How would you interpret it? Uh, and how would you read it? Which of right, these so do you think? How am I doing for time, Chris? You, you are doing very well. It's uh, 14 past three at the moment, so there's still ample time for you. I, I'll give you a heads up. Uh, the Q&A session is scheduled for, for, for 20 to four, so you still have a good 25 minutes to go.
So in terms of the responses, Rochelle, we have eight respondents thus far, and uh, we are just giving other opportunities to, to other colleagues. Uh, even our, our admin personnel supporting this webinar, take a guess and, and assist <laughs> with the, <laughs> the numbers more. We so don't know who attentively. you are. Yeah, we don't know who you are. Yeah, you don't need to be a clinician to partake in this poll. Um, <laughs> So, so thus far, it's almost uh, neck on neck on, on two of them. The one is overtaking the other one. So there's a lot of suspense at the moment. We've got 13 respondents. We will give uh, a, another 15 seconds sure. and then we will be um, then, then I'll be giving you the, the answer. I think this one is, is, is cracking people's brains much more than the previous one. Um, so um, we shall we, we we shall be reading out the poll results soon. We have got 18 responses thus far. Another few seconds. Good. Um, so Rochelle, I'm going to do it in terms of lowest to highest again in terms sure. of the leadership. We had 19 responses. Thank you so much, colleagues, for those of you. One of the colleagues that type it in the chat function, which you maybe want to also do it in the forms um, that, that, that yours is also collated there. Um, so um, that will be appreciated. Good. So in terms of um, the, the leaderboard, none said that it can be interpreted in direct sunlight. It was a uh, neck on neck in terms of the next two at 11% each can be complicated on samples refrigerated between two to eight degrees immediately after removal. And also 11% of individuals voted for none of the above. Second highest in terms of the leaderboard is um, option C that says results must be read between 20 to 40 minutes. And then 53%, um, the majority of us voted for option A, that it can be um, completed up to four hours on fresh samples kept at room temperature. So, Rochelle, the winner is A, according to this poll, which is then followed by C, and then a tie between D and E. Can we close uh, the poll? Yes, Thank you. Yes, you can close the poll. Thank you. So for those of you who did say A, give yourselves a round of applause because A is the correct answer. And I'm just going to talk a little bit more into the actual testing and the reading of results in the next section. So what you would need is you would need the lamb test kit. You need a sterile. Remember, remember I spoke to you about the issues around contamination and ensuring that we do use a sterile specimen collection container. Obviously, you're going to be using gloves. It, you will get a pipette provided with the test kit where you'll draw the urine up. So this is not uh, this is uh, you will use the pipette mm -hmm. to draw the urine up and you need a timer. Uh, and you can see here, it's a little bit of a giveaway. You monitor uh, for 25 minutes, we will generate the results. So I mentioned to you that preferably you would, you would get a better yield if we're looking at that data from an early morning specimen, but certainly random specimens can also be used. Fresh urine specimens can be used within eight hours, right? So up to eight hours if they've been kept at room temperature. If you have a sample that's been in the fridge, you need to leave it for an hour so that it comes to room temperature before you can actually do the test. So for those of you who had said that is the correct answer, you cannot use it immediately. If you put urine in a fridge, you need to take it out. You cannot freeze the urine. I, ideally, you know, we're not going to, we don't freeze the urine for testing, so you can keep it in your ordinary fridge. If you're going to bring it to room temperature, you've got to keep it for, out for about an hour and then utilize the testing. Standard guidance around uh, advice to the patient on how to actually collect the sample for you. So allowing that first part of the urine and remember the cleaning because we don't want any contamination from uh, the perineum uh, or the, any of the urogenital area. And then we would be recording uh, the test strips. We have to ensure that our test strips are, are not expired, that they've been kept within the correct storage conditions. And we can't use the test strips if they, the packaging has been damaged at all, or we notice that the test strips are wet. Once we remove the test strip 
uh, from uh, from you. So you would click from the right end because the left end would have the the, the lots uh, uh, number on that end. You would want to uh, reseal the foil pouch immediately after you remove the test strip. So you use the pipette uh, to to add the 0 0.06 moles uh, of unprocessed urine to the sample pad, and I'm not sure how clearly this shows, right? So this is where your patient results would come. The sample pad is here at the bottom. So you'd hold the pipette and, and keep it there till the the urine, uh, the 0 0.06 mole has dropped onto that pad. And then you wait a minimum of 25 minutes. So that why that one question was incorrect. So whether you're using a timer on your watch or one of those timers that we use when we're going to do HTS, we have to wait the 25 minutes to read the results. We visualize the strip in standard indoor lighting or under shade. It's not to be visualized under direct sunlight. And we cannot read it after 30 minutes because the results are only stable for up to 35 minutes from the time you apply the urine to it. So that's just, so what comes with the kit is this grading system and you can see there'll be these different lines. So you've got the positive and the negative. So you can see uh, you, would, you would hold the patient end up to these lines to be able to grade whether it's uh, one, two, three or four. And all of these are regarded as a positive. Previously, it used to be five, but since uh, the latest versions have come out, the, the grading is down to four. So previously, it was one to five. So how do we interpret? So you've waited a minimum of 25 minutes, a maximum of 35. Um, if you've got your control line, which is there, and your patient line, right? That's simple. You guys are very familiar with this within the within the context of reading of test strips results. So the color intensity that we have here, and this is the part that you would read against the script. It should be equal to or stronger than any of the colored bars in that reference scale card that you get. And and it's positive even it appear if if the patient's results is not as strong in color as the control results. So a negative result is the same as you would see. You need the control line to ensure you have a valid test and your patient would have no purple or gray bar. When you look at what an invalid result is, an invalid result is that if there is no control line within the control window and you may or may not have a result within the patient window. And so this, uh, some of the, 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 the guidance that may be causing this, maybe an insufficient waiting period or an insufficient urine specimen sample had been placed, or there may be an issue with the, the, the test strip itself that it may be faulty or expired, we would repeat the test within this, uh, within this context. And the guidance is that if we repeat the test and we get a similar response, that we need to notify our rep about it and use another method uh, alongside our GXP or other in order to be able to get a diagnosis. Then there is, I've never seen this one, equivocal. In your reference age, or you can see that it doesn't actually uh, fully fill um, the, the the patient sample that that uh, bar line that it should. And so, as we would do for invalid, we can collect a new sample early in the morning um, and repeat it, or you could take another sample and then uh, uh, repeat the test. So. As with all things, colleagues, we hate administration. But remember that if we are going to use this test in, the, in, in diagnosing our clients for HIV, we need to ensure that we are adequately recording our LAM data. And I know that there is a little bit of guidance uh, around this within the, 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 the guidance document. So a nurse or a doctor can administer the test. 
we record the specimen collection data and results in the patient file, and then we also need to record it within our TB uh, identification register under the non-bacteriological investigations conducted session, as well as being recorded into the TB module of chair.net. And then the clinicians would then collate the data for the Aleph lamb test done with their respective uh, results and complete the monthly summary sheet, which is found um, on the TB identification register. So this will be found on the left hand side of the register where you would enter the patient's details there and on the right hand side of the register under the non bacteriological investigations, you would enter the results from your urine lamb. So remember, we should not see a urine lamb without a gene expert ultra and or other diagnostics, depending on what that expert result is. And um, we would uh, we would then collate at the bottom of this. Uh, you would you would collate all of these results, and on the next page, you would uh, then document on a monthly basis what um, what your your positivity rate was in terms of the urine lamb. So very exciting. Uh, it's not yet in use. It's been utilized. Um, in, in, in clinical research settings is there's this novel LAMP point of care test, uh, which was used um, uh, from the, the cohorts of three patients uh, that had been hospitalized uh, within Cape Town. And they compared what we have now, which is the ALEA LAMP with this novel Fuji LAMP uh, point of care test. They, they looked at 968 stored samples. 62% of those uh, uh, patients had been confirmed as having TB. And when they looked at the relative sensitivities and specificities comparing the two, you can see that Fuji lamb certainly uh, did much better than the Alia lamb in terms of its sensitivity and the ability to pick up uh, TB in those clients uh, that had uh, microbiologically confirmed TB, the specificity was a little low. What they also found lower, what they also found that it was most sensitive in as we would expect in those with CD4s that were under 100, and this was 26.9% higher than Alia Lam, and certainly more studies is going to be taken to look at the utility, uh, certainly of using this modality. I'm not sure when this will become available, um, because at the moment, the TB Alia Lam is the only one that has been endorsed uh, by the WHO for use in the diagnosis of TB. What we, what we can see though from the study is combined with experts, the Fuji lamb could diagnose nearly three quarters of all of those with microbiologically confirmed TB within 24 hours. And that certainly will go a long way in terms of us being able to manage our patients. So lastly, this is my last slide colleagues. We know that TB diagnosis is challenging. I, I, from from the, the time I've been working within clients, we've seen so many clients who've come in with advanced HIV disease where, uh, where we have not been able to make the diagnosis who then come back with unmasking iris. And so the urine lamb certainly provides a, a tool for us that can assist to diagnose TB within 30 minutes. Because if the lamb is positive, we are going to start TB treatment on those clients because it denotes that there is actively um, degeneration of mycobacterial uh, 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 within that client. We know that we use it in all our hospitalized HIV positive clients and that we can now extend it to clients with CD4s less than uh, 200 or WHO stage 3 or 4 who have presumptive TB. It's important to ensure that whenever we are doing these tests that we are accurate, accurately recording them within our uh, patient files as well as within our TB identification registers. It's very important that the LAM is not the primary diagnostic tool which is endorsed uh, for use on its own. It's 
So it needs to be able to to be used with the Gene Expert Ultra as the initial screening test on your sputum or non sputum samples to confirm that MTB result and susceptibility to rifampicin, where we our patients cannot uh, produce a sample, but the expert is negative, certainly we need to ensure that we are looking at the cultures and DSTBs, uh, uh, and we need to ensure that the results are followed up when we have a lamb that is positive. Lastly, when we are communicating between upper levels, uh, like your hospitals, where I see that most of these lambs are now available, and your patients may leave your facilities to go down to lower levels of care to ensure that there is specific communication regarding the follow up of these patients to ensure that those nursing staff or doctors who are going to take over the management at the lower level are able to uh, to do so. Thanks, Wenzel. I'm going uh, and Chris, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. That's my last. Slide. Thank you so much, uh, Rochelle. A magnificent presentation as always. Uh, two comments um, that, that also came through your discussion. Um, there, there was one uh, in terms of in KZN in Peter Maritzburg specifically that LAM is currently done at hospitals and CHCs, but um, not at primary healthcare level. Um, there's also a colleague that contributed from Northwest province, specifically in Bojanala district, where it's uh, implemented in hospitals. So um, I, I think it's baby steps um, with yes. the fact that th this is definitely uh, something that, 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 that could still be very, very new and unknown to many of our clinical colleagues out there. But with the fact that this is being rolled out and we, we do have national endorsement, they are nationally accepted um, uh, and already distributed national policy guidelines that are being circulated. I think really um, the task now for every participant here is to, to, to be the change agent. And after this, um, this this webinar, really start inquiring. You know, is this available um, in my in my district, and and how to 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 capacitate people? So, Rochelle, with with your many years of experience within the world of of HIV, there, there's always reluctance when it comes to anything new, and and you did provide um, us with quite a number of key messages in terms of substantial reasons to endorse uh, the the ordering of this. But what are the potential barriers that you foresee from your side that could still hamper the, the, the further rollout and, and, and uptake of the special investigation? So I, I think, Chris, that, you know, originally within my experience within KZN, it was originally provided in 100 packs of 100. It was very costly. And it came with very short expiry dates. Uh, to be honest, I haven't been in facilities uh, within the last, because of COVID, within the last uh, six or seven months. But the strips are now being provided in 20 packs of 25. And certainly what I think is, is that whenever we talk about um, uh, the utility of, of, of anything, the supply chain becomes something that becomes important. So what are the roles and responsibilities of, of all of the different role players within the health system to ensure that this is rolled out? So one of the challenges is going to be number one, costing. And I, I had tried to find out from, from the KZN TB program manager what the current cost of those 25 strips was. Um, but I think that previously cost was a barrier and I know that even within King Edward Hospital, which is a regional center here in Etchebunia municipality, they had only been provided 200 kits for the year to the end, which a large proportion of those were allocated to the, um, to the uh, uh, medical wards and the adult infectious diseases wards. And there was a challenge with other wards getting access to it, such as the maternity wards, where we know that in our pregnant uh, 
uh, HIV positive population, TB certainly is one of the leading causes of death. I think the other issue is going to be around um, training and mentoring of staff at facility level once they are available. So who is responsible in the supply chain? The regional training centers are meant to support the LAM rollout uh, with training at a district and a sub-district level. The HIV and TB program managers are meant to forecast volumes that will be required for the district and sub-district level and then monitor the demand and supply on an ongoing basis and develop budgets within those districts in consultation with the other health programs. So if we if we're looking at it, there are different role players uh, at a facility level um, where you have pharmacists and pharmacy assistants, they would issue and distribute the kits and ensure that there's appropriate storage of those kits within the facilities. Our, oper our operational managers are going to be responsible for ordering administering those, the, the nurses and doctors at a PHC or a CHC level would be responsible for uh, appropriately uh, reading those results, uh, interpreting documentation uh, of those results in the clinical setting. And then in our hospital levels, you know, that's where you've got registrars and specialists and clinical associates and all of these other um, other fields where SOPs would need to be drawn up so that once it's introduced in your facility, once everyone has access and we know that there's a supply chain, that people understand, they know how to do it, they know what must happen so that there's proper application, interpreting and recording of those results. Brilliant, really, and it's it's all about a very comprehensive quality improvement project um, that, that, that that need to be followed. So thank you so much for your mention about uh, the, the need for clinical record keeping. And uh, I think that collectively we as clinicians know that uh, many times our clinical record keeping leaves much to desire. And it's actually one of the gaps that we identified when we developed a, a national m and &E, uh, reporting framework as well, specifically in terms of, of the tracking of, of the utilization of, of urine lamb as well, that that was underutilized. So it's so obviously a lot need to be done in terms of, of the recording of that as well. So I just want to ask a naughty question. So anecdotally, um, I've, I've heard that some colleagues, you know, colleagues are not always uh, uh, looking at guidelines. Some colleagues say, you know, a guideline is there only to guide us, but, but we are the doctors after all. So, so I know about some, some doctors practicing bush medicine and I ventured, you know, into the unknown and using urine lamb um, as an adjunct type of diagnostic criteria for, for pleural effusions and not really relying, you know, on the clinical presentation of the IADA, the biomarkers, the, uh, the, uh, the, the white cell count, and then obviously the fact that it's a straw colored unilateral type of pleural effusion. So, it looks like urine. <laughs> Would, would you would you recommend exactly you know you take the words out of my mouth so 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 would you would you be a little bit cautious and let's do the same for pleural for for ascites you know for patient with pleural effusion it could also look a bit like urine it's just a little bit lighter so would you want to venture into doing a urine lamb there or would you be a little bit cautious the 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 lamb is only for use with urine we cannot use it with any other samples. It's not like our gene expert ultra, and it's not like our culture. You can do if you wanna if you wanna look at your plural fluid, the gene expert ultra would be the one that you would do there. We know that the sensitivity of the gene expert ultra in plural fluids just over fifty percent, and it's got quite a high specificity. So if you're pulling the fluid you're going to send off for the outer. The lamb is only indicated for use in urine, unfortunately. Because of the remember, we know that there's disseminated TB because it's cleared by the kidneys and it's excreted in the urine. Because you're naughty. 
<laughs> I, I have to keep people awake. It's late in the afternoon. So, so colleagues, I would like to open the floor for any questions from your side or any comments. So if you've got left experiences or, or any concerns or challenges that you anticipate, then we would love to hear from you. We still have a few more minutes and uh, I think everyone will, will, will gain from anyone that would like to share any experiences or concerns or maybe even if you want to share your approach that you are going to, to, to be doing after all your all be change makers from now on you will be the pioneers for for really piloting uh, uh urine lamp testing with within your geographical area of practice and and getting it to scale so really the floor is open and i'm hoping there will be some comments so please uh, raise your hand and uh, then you're welcome to unmute your microphone any comments will really be appreciated And while colleagues are just thinking about that, you know, uh, you, in my introduction, you kindly mentioned uh, some of the work that we did with the HIV toolkit. Oh, let me let uh, the colleague first speak and I'll come back and speak afterwards, Chris. Yes, so colleague, please do go ahead. You've raised your hand and uh, we, we welcome your inputs. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm Dr. Chambo from uh, Northwest. I I don't have much experience with LAMP, though I know the hospitals around here are using it. I think this brings uh, to my attention that I should go and, and, and find out more about LAMP in my district mm -hmm. and eventually in the province. Um, I want to respond to the issues of, of the barriers. One, one common barrier I, I, I find that makes us to delay to implement any new guideline is just the, the time that uh, it takes between when the guideline is released and the communication to the people down there in the facilities. So I, I, I believe one thing that should help us is to have time frames that when a guideline is, uh, a particular guideline is, is being released, it should be very clear to people that at least by this time, uh, the users at the facility level should be trained and uh, the whatever that it is, whether it is the, 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 the urine lamb uh, test kits should be available by the time. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about different things that have been implemented. So the particular thing that is necessary to be implemented at the time should be time frames uh, from the National Department of Health that this should be implemented. At, by this time. And I think, um, or, or not, not I think, in Bujanala or Northwest, we, the RTC had actually planned the trainings and the, the, they planned the physical trainings and they were just disturbed by lockdown four. I believe that they will, they will regroup and, and have the, the training soon. Then lastly is a question on the presentation I'm, I'm asking myself this question and I couldn't answer myself. What, what, what will be the conditions where we have to put the urine in the fridge? Because this is a point of care <laughs> testing. Uh, so, yes, so when I was yes. looking at the issue of the fridge, I'm asking myself, is, will there be a condition where I have to put the urine in the fridge? I thank you, colleagues. No, no, thank you for, for your comments. And I think, um, I think that whenever we look at policy guidance, I think that having a really great uh, roll out of the new guidance when new policy guidelines come out is really, really good. And you can see that there was a dedicated and a specific effort when it came to the introduction of TLD. We had master trainers who were trained at a national level from all of the provinces. And those master trainers then went down, which included the, our, our DOH colleagues, as well as our district support partners, to then begin to cascade the information so that it made it down to facility level. Uh, because there had been a time frame for that to be implemented. So I think that that is still a challenge, and especially in the era of COVID, uh, where face-to-face meetings are really a challenge and we have connectivity issues in some areas of South Africa. So you can see I'm sitting in Etiguini. I've been between my phone, my home Wi-Fi and my APM and certainly being able to train colleagues 
um, and, and also the practical demonstration parts. So, so your colleagues around there are really valid. Um, I think with regards to, I hadn't, re I saw that in the guideline and in my own, my own, I don't know if others did have a, a thought around it. I, I, I think that it's because they had done testing of samples like that last study where they looked at um, urine that had been uh, frozen and then removed. For it may be that uh, there may be colleagues who might not want to do a lamb in the middle of the night uh, when a client presents at midnight and may be too tired or they think they may not be able to use it. I don't think I personally would see and that being implemented really because we would ideally want it to be a point of care test. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you're sitting in a casualty and you're able to do a lamb at one o'clock in the morning and the lamb is positive and you've diagnosed TB within 35 minutes? That's unheard of. Um, so that's my response to you. And thank you. Thank you for going and looking for the lamb now in the Northwest. We did. I did. I went to the Northwest twice. It was a very long drive between the different hospitals. So I really... Uh, I take my hat off to colleagues also that work in those district hospitals because sometimes there's a real scarcity of resources, but in, even in some district hospitals where they didn't even have access to something as simple as a UNE. Um, so if you can get the, the lamb there, you know, uh, that would be wonderful. I saw that there was a question in the chat. Uh, Chris, just with regards to what ICD-10 code, if you look in the guidance document, um, they have a whole list of which codes you would use based on uh, whether it's uh, without mention of bacterial or histological confirmation. I personally have not had to notify, so I would leave any other colleagues with the expertise related to which one you would choose for for around the different codes that are there within the manual uh, to be able to respond to that question. So yes, there is there's, there's yes. another question as well. So so thanks, um, Kwaku, for that question in terms of ICD-10, and I think the, uh, the the guideline will be very useful as well as as a point of reference. There was also a question posted by, by, by Lebo, and, and that is really just a deja vu for me in terms of supply chain management and things getting out of stock. Um, just maybe, you know, to, to share with you, giving away my age a little bit, uh, when, when, when the ARB program was just launched in South Africa, we were very limited in terms of the ARB regimens. And there was literally a time that uh, we were giving patients the individual drugs, as many of you might remember, we didn't have combination treatment. And then uh, the third component was, was either efavirenz or nevirapine. So there was a time that we were completely out of efavirenz and then we had to swap patients to, um, to, to, to nevirapine. And there was another time as well that we, we used to use that terrible drug called stavidine. And uh, so stavidine was out of stock at the stage. And then we had to swap it around to AZT as well. And obviously you can imagine what the ramifications for that was. So, so leading on that, the question that, that Lebo posted is in terms of um, what happens if the urine lamp tests are finished? Where are, are they being ordered from? Is there a, a central hub? Um, is, is it a, a pharmaceutical consumable? Can you maybe enlighten us in terms of that, Rochelle? Yes, it is a pharmaceutical consumable. And so the, the, you know, you would need to begin to speak with your pharmacy managers. And also it would depend, you saw, so the HAST and the TV program managers will be responsible for forecasting and allocation of budgets based on the facilities to know what, what, what would happen uh, what what could, what would be available for facilities for order within the the districts and the sub districts, and then the facilities would then order that when they are ordering via their pharmacies because it's the pharmaceutical services your pharmacists and your pharmacy uh, assistants at your PHC level they will be responsible for the appropriate storage of those test kits. And I think with the fact that there are guidelines now and there is awareness being created, the demand will obviously also increase. And um, 
obviously, as as I mentioned earlier, myself and Rochelle did see a facility where, 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 where the tests were available, but the stuff, they didn't know it, and it literally got expired because of just, just the fact that no one was informed. So I think those of you that are supporting this level facilities, please, please do get in touch with uh, the, the, the pharmacy colleagues as well and find out about uh, channels of of, of, of this being made available for you. And I think the, obviously the more that this is being used, uh, the, the, the more uh, demand will be created. Um, and then I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat box. Is there anyone from the floor that would like to raise your hand maybe for some final comments uh, before we, we wrap up or, or maybe any other questions that you might have for Rochelle? The opportunity is yours now. Um, I'll, I'll give it a few seconds. Anyone still would like to ask any question? There's a question from from Joel. Uh, Jillian, you are, you are, you're one of the familiar names on our list. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. So thank you, Rochelle, for a wonderful, clear uh, webinar. Um, just in terms of your answer to the ICD-10 code, I'm cheating a little bit. I'm actually reading from the, the guideline okay. here. <laughs> A TB diagnosed using this test should be considered to be clinically diagnosed TB. So as a positive urine lamb test is not bacteriological confirmation, therefore the ICD-10 code for PTB will be A16.1. And for extra pulmonary TB, these will depend on the suspected site of the disease. And they actually refer to an in the guidelines. So it's very clear in the guidelines for colleagues. So, Kwaku, your answer is well covered. Thanks, Joel, for, for, for stepping to the floor and, and, and helping us out with that one. As always, much appreciated. Thank you.